Hello, and welcome to Fairview Baptist Church. I'm Pastor John Boyacek. I'm so glad you could join us in worship today. I trust that you will be blessed. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're actually going to be looking at one verse there and a couple verses in chapter 3 as well. Usernames, passwords, PIN numbers, these are all things of our modern age uh, designed to give us access to information that we need that is important to us. And it's also designed to keep others from getting at it as well. Now, of course, if you forget one of those passwords, your access is denied, as I have found out by bitter experience. Or if you punch it in wrong, your access is denied, which I have also learned by bitter experience. How do you come up with passwords anyway? I mean, what is your method? I re read of one guy who, who takes a story that he's familiar, familiar with, something that's happened to him, uh, and he uses words from that story to fashion his password. Say, uh, Caribbean cruise. I don't know why that comes to mind today, but Caribbean cruise. Uh, four of us went. Uh, I'm just making this up. This didn't really happen. Caribbean cruise, four of us went. We did three excursions during that seven-day period. And so he would take the numbers and words, Caribbean cruise, excursions, so on, and make passwords out of it. And then every 60 to 90 days, he would shuffle those words and numbers around uh, so he could still remember and still use the same story uh, but he would change those passwords, as we all do every 60 to 90 days, right? <laughs> yes, of course. Access. It's a great privilege when you have access to something or someone. It is a great privilege. And it is one of the great privileges we have as believers in Christ. We have access to God the Father. Look with me at chapter 2, verse 18. For through him, through Christ, we both, that is, Jew and Gentile, having now come together in the body of Christ, the church, we have access by one Spirit to the Father. We have access. Now, this is an important uh, message because... Paul has been talking about the fact that we have, through Christ, peace with God and peace with each other, and we have this now access to God's presence. Now, the importance of that is that the reconciliation that Christ has won for us is not just a judicial reconciliation. What do I mean by that? Okay, you could have two warring nations who come together, sit down at the negotiating table, and they hammer out a peace treaty. And they both agree to it, and they both sign it, and they think, okay, great, this, this is going to bring peace. Now, do they immediately get up from the table and say, well, this is wonderful. Listen, why don't we have a sleepover tonight? Probably not. Because... For some in those countries, they suffered a lot through that war. And there may be some bitter feelings that remain that are going to take time, if ever, to get over. But the peace is there in a judicial sense. In Christ, we have more than just that judicial reconciliation. We have access to the Father. Uh, the Father who has been offended by our sin. 
A father who lost a son in the war against sin. A father who, who, who could be bitter toward us. But we find out that that's not the case. That he invites us into his presence. We have access to him. Now, we, we notice that the Trinity is involved in this access. Verse 18 again. For through him, Jesus, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Christ has won the right for us to come before the Father. The Spirit is the one who brings us before the Father. We have fellowship with the Father when we get there. This word access only appears three times in the New Testament. Twice in the book of Ephesians, we'll be looking at both of those texts. We've just looked at one. And then Romans 5.2 is the other passage that speaks about access. And they all refer to access to God. In Romans 5, uh, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we have access right now and we have a hope for the future. And that is through Jesus Christ and our justification by faith. So then how do we come to the Lord? We have this access. Do we come apprehensively? Do we come timidly? Well, that's where we go to Ephesians chapter 3 and look at verses 12 and 13. In whom we have boldness. And access with confidence through our faith in him. Now, if you have the NIV, it probably has the word, uh, uh, what, what is the word in the NIV? Freedom. Freedom, thank you. Uh, instead of access. But it is the same word access that we had in chapter 2, verse 18. In whom we have boldness. Boldness. Okay, that word boldness has to do with uh, telling all. Literally, that's what the word means. Telling all. It has the idea of unreserved freedom of speech. So when we come before God, our, our boldness is not that we're cocky and arrogant or something like that, but it's that we can unburden our heart to Him. We can tell Him everything and anything. First of all, he knows it all anyway. So why would we try to hide it? But we, just, we can just put it all out there. There's an absence of fear in speaking our heart. Now you think of many of the Psalms. That David and the other Psalm writers do exactly that. They just put it all out there. Lord, this is the way I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. What are you going to do about it? And they just put it out. They're telling all. They're coming boldly. And that's the way we are to come before the Lord. Now, we have a great advantage over the Old Testament saints. I mean, there are a number of great prayers included in the Old Testament text. Wonderful prayers. But we have something even greater than they had. You see, back in the Old Testament, the high priest could go into the holiest place, the Holy of Holies, once a year on behalf of the people. Now, he had to go in carefully. Uh, One misstep could mean his death. And they would have a rope tied to his foot to drag him out in case he did die in there. Because nobody else could go in to get him. When Christ died, that veil that separated the holiest place from the holy place was torn from top to bottom. And by that, God was saying, now every believer has access into my presence, just like the high priest had in the Old Testament. You can come anytime to talk to me. We have boldness. 
But we also, it says, we have confidence in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. So we can come confidently. Now, we come at the assistance of someone else, of course, Jesus Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit that takes us into God's presence. But how, how do we get an audience with a king? If I wanted an audience with King Charles, would I just show up at the gate at Buckingham Palace and say, I'm here to see King Charles. Show me in. It doesn't work that way, does it? I would need an invitation. I would need, I would need to be invited. Now, the problem is King Charles doesn't know me from Adam. So that's not going to work. Furthermore, let, let's pretend, this isn't the case, but let's pretend that he did know me. And uh, he had a problem with me because I owed him a, an incredible debt. How would he feel? Would he really want to see me? Maybe to wring my neck? So it is with God. We owed him a great debt. We needed someone to go on our behalf. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Who goes into the presence of God and says, Father, I have someone I want you to meet. It is very important to me that you treat this person as you treat me. I know, I know this person owed you a great debt, but I have paid that debt in full. Please accept them. And so then, when we are ushered into the presence of the living God, He accepts us and says, Welcome. It is great that you're here. I want you to know that from now on you can call me daddy. And that you're welcome to come in here anytime. You have access to me. I'm your father. This is, this is what Christ has done for us. This is, this is what's happening. This is the kind of access we have where we can cry out, Abba, Father, Dada, Daddy. We have access with boldness. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, we read, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then come with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's come with confidence. This is the believer's privilege. Convicted murderer Mary Fitzpatrick lived in the White House. Uh, she had been serving her sentence for murder in a Georgia state prison, prison. She had an exemplary prison record. She was coming up for parole. And then Governor Jimmy Carter invited her into his home, into the governor's mansion in Georgia, to be the nanny to their daughter, Amy. And then when he was elected president of the United States, she moved with the Carters into the White House. So here's a convicted murderer living in the White House. But you know, we have something even better than that. We're not only invited into the throne room of God, we are considered family. We are part of his family. By the virtue of the new birth, we are members of his family. This is a great privilege that we have. Now, the unbeliever does not have that kind of access. The unbeliever, uh, God is under no obligation to listen to 
the prayer of an unbeliever. He will listen to the prayer of repentance and faith. He will hear the cry for salvation. He will listen to that. But technically, the unbeliever is at war with God. We've seen that in Ephesians 2. There's a reconciliation that needs to take place. Having said that, on occasion, God will answer the prayer of an unbeliever. Just as you or I might answer the need of someone who is not our child. For instance, just scenario. The kid down the block, one day you look out the window, and the, this, this kid is tromping around on your prized petunias, and you go out and say, what on earth are you doing? Well, there's a toad in here, and I'm trying to get, catch the toad. And you say, get out of there. You have no business being in there. You're ruining my petunias. And so the kid sulks off. A couple days later, the kid is standing at your door crying. Well, he's fallen on the sidewalk outside your home and skinned his knee. And so he, he's coming looking for some help. What would you do? Would you say, Oh, go away, you snotty-nosed kid. You know, it serves you right. Go home. Get out of here. No, you, if you have any Christian grace at all in your heart, you would say, okay, let's get this fixed up. Let me get this cleaned up. It's not that the child deserved it, but common grace, common grace causes you to respond. And sometimes God, in his common grace to all mankind, answers the prayer of an unbeliever. Paul said in Romans, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And sometimes God in his goodness will do good things for unsaved people in order to draw them to himself. But he's under no obligation to do that. Whereas those of us who know the Lord, we have this freedom of access into his presence. Now, as Paul, in chapters, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, Paul is at the end of one of his long sentences. Remember in chapter 1, we had verses 3 through 13, which was one sentence in the original language. Well, in, in, in here we have, uh, from verse 2 on, one sentence continuous sentence. And so he's kind of wrapping this up. He's been talking about the mystery of the church that he has been called to unfold and explain and deliver to, to mankind. Uh, this this uh, mystery that has brought Jew and Gentile together and, and formed one body, the church, and, and how God has has done amazing things uh, in unfolding this mystery. And then he says, in whom you have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So he says, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Don't lose heart. You see, I, Paul says, I've been called to explain this mystery to expound this mystery, to show this mystery to, to people everywhere. As a result of that, I've been thrown into prison, I've been beaten, I've suffered a lot. But don't lose heart over that. To lose heart simply means to become no good. I don't want you to become no good over what I'm suffering. You see, the access that we have to God should give us reason not to lose heart. But I believe it's in the area of prayer that we often do lose heart. We kind of get, oh. When we lived in Stouffville, I decided to enter a 5K 
Masters Race at Thompson Park in Scarborough. Now, Masters Race simply means for old people, okay? You had to be, you had to be at least 40 to, to enter the Masters Race. I know, that seems very young now. Uh, people who are under 40, I, I think they call them minions. <laughs> there were no minions in this race, only masters. I was 47 at the time, by the way. And uh, so I got there in good time because I wanted to kind of get the lay of the land and get ready for it. And so before the race started, I, I saw another runner and, and I asked him, I said, do you know where the finish line is? So we walked over and he, he pointed to the asphalt walkway that we would be running on. And uh, there, sure enough, was a painted line that had the word finish there. And I thought, okay, I'll tuck that away. That's a good bit of information to know. So we get lined up and the, actually the start line and the finish line were the same line. So we're lined up there, ready to go, the gun sounds and off we go. Now I need to explain to you that I had prepared well for this race. I had done the distance, I had done the hill work, I'd done the speed work, everything that I could do to prepare myself for this race I had done to the best of my ability. And it was a fairly flat course, so it was fast. And uh, I was flying, you know, I was a legend in my own mind, okay? <laughs> All right, so out, I, out we go, and uh, we, get, we get to the turnaround point out halfway, and uh, I look at my clock, my watch, and, and I'm thinking, this is unbelievable, okay? Uh, you know, at this pace, I'm going to be sub-17 for a 5K. And, and so I, I, was, I was duly impressed, and I just kept pouring it on. I thought, all right, you know, you're doing it, let's keep going. And I knew that as we got to Near the end, there was a little footbridge that we would go over, and then there was a, a, a short rise. It wasn't, wasn't long, but just a little rise, and then around to the left, boom, there was the finish line. Okay? Over, up, boom, down. Okay, great. So I see the bridge coming up, and I think, almost done. All right, let's pour it on. And I've just given it everything, just laying it all out there, on that track and, and just giving it my best over the bridge, starting up the rise. And all of a sudden, I look down and I see near the top of this rise an arrow pointing this way. And there's a race official standing up here and she is pointing this way. But the finish line's over here. The, the, the TV cameras are over here. The book deals over here. The movie rights are over here. I mean, my adoring public is waiting over here. But the race went this way. Oh yeah, that was the finish line, all right, but you had to do this big loop and come around from the other side to the finish line. Well, I lost heart. I was, I was so upset because I put everything out. And I thought, I'm almost done. I don't have to reserve anything. And I had nothing left. I, I slowed down. I even walked a few steps. I was upset. I was angry with myself, first of all, for not asking more questions before the race started. I was angry with the race officials. I mean, how long would it have taken them to stay before we started? It's out, back, and this loop, and then you finish right here. Five seconds. But oh no, they didn't tell us that. They left us to our own devices. I was, I was upset because I knew the government would not compensate me for my pain and suffering. <laughs> anyway, my pity party lasted probably 20 seconds. And then I got going again and, 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 and finished fine. Not, maybe not as, as good as I was hoping or thinking it was going to be. Uh, legendary status does not apply. <laughs> but that story is a microcosm 
of what happens to many of us in life. We put energy, time, resources, effort into something that is important to us. A relationship, a job, a career, a business, a degree, a a property, a child, you name it. And then something comes along that we consider a detour. It's part of God's plan, but we look on it as a detour. And we lose heart. We think, I've got nothing left to give on this. I've given everything. And we become no good to ourselves or to others. So it is with prayer. We put energy, effort, time into prayer requests that matter to us. And we, we have in our minds how this should play out. If we were God, this is what we would do in response to this prayer. We envision the perfect outcome or at least a satisfactory one. And then a detour. The prayer doesn't get answered or it doesn't get answered the way we think it should. And Wait, what? what what's going on here? God doesn't answer. We lose heart. We quit praying, or we pray half-heartedly. It hurts too much to continue. Paul could have said that as he languished in prison. Oh, this is nuts. Why am I suffering like this? Can't God get me out of this dump? Can't he do something for me? Well, I'm wasting my time praying. I'll just figure this out on my own. Instead... He says, I don't want you to lose heart. I don't want you to quit praying for me just because my suffering continues. Don't lose heart. If we were to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we would find that twice in that chapter, Paul says, we do not lose heart. And he explains in that chapter a number of reasons why he could have lost heart. And other reasons why he didn't lose heart. Let me just give you an example. 2 Corinthians 4, 7-9, he writes, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. The treasure that he spoke of being in the jars of clay from the previous verse we know is Jesus Christ. That's the treasure he had. That's the thing that kept him from losing heart. I've got a treasure. You've got a treasure. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't lose heart. Even though we're afflicted and perplexed and persecuted and struck down. We keep on going because we have Christ. Your prayer life may have taken a beating. You may be confused by detours, things that you think, why has this happened? Why hasn't something else happened? God seems to be inactive. Where is He? What's He up to? What's He doing? You may feel beaten down by the enemy. Time to get back up and get in the race. Another issue for many people is you feel that I'm such an insignificant Christian. I mean, I'm a nobody. I'm not high profile. I can understand why God would listen to so-and-so because she's such a saint. For he's such a saint. But why would God bother listening to me? Who am I? He's got bigger fish to fry than my problems. Yeah, they're big problems to me, but they're insignificant to God. So why would, why would he bother? Stuart Sylvester was a pastor at Bramalee Baptist Church. Is that a swear word here? 
Anyway, it's kind of like, kind of like corner gas, you know, when it, somebody would mention Woolerton and everybody would spit. <laughs> I'm afraid, don't, don't spit, please. All right. But he was a pastor at Bramley Baptist for many years. And uh, he was driving Richard DeHaan of the radio Bible class uh, to the airport. And on their way, Stuart was saying, recently I was talking to uh, a friend who is a pilot and has a small plane that he flies out of Pearson. And I asked him, do you have any problems, like, you know, with flying a small plane out of there? And here's what he said. My plane may be small, but I have the same rights and privileges, same access to that airport that anyone else has. Yes, even the jumbo jets. And you know what? That's what we have as believers. You may feel that you're insignificant, that you're just a new Christian or a young Christian or not a very effective Christian, but you have the same access to the throne room of God that the greatest saint you can imagine has. So, don't lose heart. Keep on praying. Let's pray. Lord, we need this challenge. I need this challenge. Because I know it can be discouraging. I've been praying for loved ones for years that still aren't saved. I've been praying for things to happen that still haven't happened. And it's easy to lose heart. And I pray, Father, that you will help us as individuals, as a church, not to lose heart when it comes to appreciating and using our access to God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad you're able to join us today in worship. If you have a need, a prayer request, feel free to reach out to us at the church here. You can give us a call or you can also email us. God bless you.